So on to our actual official lecturer for this evening. Uh, this is Professor Allison Schofield, who is an associate professor of religious studies here at DU. She specializes in the Dead Sea Scrolls and is the author or co-author of three books, including her monograph on the origins of the Dead Sea Scrolls, From Qumran to the Yahad, A New Paradigm of Textual Development for the Community Rule, which came out in 2009. Not to mention, she's edited various other volumes and authored a large number of essays on the Dead Sea Scrolls, on the Bible, and on early Judaism. She's currently working on the official translation and edition of the charter text of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the community rule, under contract with Grill and the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation. And we have breaking news just as of a couple of minutes ago, she informed me um, that she has also just been named to take over as co-editor of the entire Dead Sea Scrolls project, um, which is... <laughs> gets better um, because she is not only doing this, she's the first American to be asked to do this, and perhaps most importantly, she's the first woman ever to be asked to do this. So go, Allison. Um, she's been featured on the History Channel, the Travel Channel, and PBS Colorado. Uh, we're lucky that instead of staying home and watching her on TV, we get her live and in person with us this evening. Um, she will be presenting in English, um, but that is one of her many languages that she's fluent in. Her primary research languages are Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Akkadian, Ugaritic, and Ethiopic. Um, and she works with seven other modern and ancient languages. Um, so when I said I've been wondering what I've been doing with my life, uh, you can start to see why I'm asking myself these questions. Um, I am fluent in English, both American and British. <laughs> That's what I got. Um, she has a doctorate from the University of Notre Dame in the area of Bible and Judaism in antiquity, and a master's degree from Johns Hopkins University in Hebrew Bible and Northwest Semitic languages. Suffice it to say, she is an incredibly productive researcher and scholar who also weaves her work into the classroom. Um, we are so very, very lucky to have her here again, especially since she's about to leave tomorrow morning for a five-week trip to Israel. Um, so this is um, astonishing that she is able to do this. Her lecture is going to be entitled, How the Bible Became a Book, The Rise of Scripture in Judaism and Christianity. Following her talk, there will be uh, time for a question and answer session. Please help me in welcoming Professor Allison Schofield. Thank you, Ingrid. I really think you should take up some more dead languages. That would really help your uh, introductions. Well, welcome, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here to see so many faces, current students, um, community members, colleagues, friends, members of the sanctuary, um, past students, alumni. It's really great to see that free food and drink still draws you in great numbers. <laughs> that part of college that never leaves you, I think. Um, so a few years ago, when I was about 20, um, I was studying abroad in Jerusalem, an early undergraduate, and uh, I was standing in line, in, the ba in, in line at the bank, and there was some sort of security lockdown. And standing there, kind of clueless as I was, uh, for about an hour, stood in line, and um, an elderly gentleman who was standing in line in front of me turned around and, talk, and began speaking with me. He was so jovial and so enthusiastic, and he said, I got to show you this thing, and he showed me these pictures of something called the Copper Scroll. This is something, this, this is a Baptist minister from Texas who had been digging for the for the objects on this copper scroll for 20 years. 
So big oil money kind of support him. I'd like that. I'd like to have that kind of support. Uh, to be digging for this. And, and he said, you know, you really got to see this because there are these lost treasures of the Jerusalem temple, and I'm about to find them. He said, I'm on the verge of finding the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> so, of course, intrigued. He said, I'm about to find this, and when I do... Said, I will turn this world right side up. This will prove that the Bible is true. Now, growing up in a Jewish and Christian household, I was familiar with that phrase somewhat. It sort of resonated a bit. A Christian and Jewish household when I was young. And yet, on the other hand, I felt like maybe he'd watched five too many times Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> But those words never really left me. I wondered about the Bible and exactly what role does it play? Is it an archeological manual? Is it something that we use to prove something about our religious beliefs? What do we do with that? What does it mean to say the Bible is true? Now, a little addendum to this story, um, nothing to do with this Bendel Jones, who's not really quite a professor, but um, a couple years later, I ended up doing my, starting a PhD in uh, this very item, the Copper Scroll. Uh, became interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls and began working on them. After I took the position at DU, I ended up writing an episode, co-writing an episode for the History Channel on this Copper Scroll. And after they filmed, which they do, they take your story and then they sort of make it television, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> so after I viewed it, this, this episode, and this was also the episode I, I repelled into a cave, the Dead Sea Scrolls that you can walk right into. So this is television, right? But I'm trying, trying to get the word out there. I see the episode and Vendel Jones is on that very same episode. <laughs> And I thought, what are the chances? So uh, my protestations to the, to the um, director were met with, well, he may not have any academic credentials, but he's very good television. <laughs> and he is. He really is. So that said, what do we do with not only this idea of Bible as true, but also the media's view on the Bible? Now, you'll notice here the Hebrew is upside down, just details, of course. Um, and also, I did not know that the Dead Sea Scrolls predicted that Hillary Clinton would be elected president in three years. <laughs> now, this is from 1993, so it's an interesting. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do with this? Has, like the media likes to, to inform us, lost scrolls been found? Have parts of the Bible been suppressed, taken out? Has the Bible been changed over 2,000 years of being copied? Are there more scrolls to be discovered? So these things come to us in our home as we watch the media, but what is it that we can really rely on? So today I'm going to give you a little bit of historical background to this. Now, of course, I'm not going to tell you what to believe about the Bible, if you believe anything. But of course, as a religious studies scholar, we're here not just to study religiously. <laughs> we're here to teach about religion from a historical, anthropological, linguistic, philosophical perspective. So today, I'm going to approach this topic of the Bible a little bit with some critical distance. So a little bit of context about this. The Bible itself is something you all probably have it in your head. You have an object, or maybe you've, you own one or two. You have it. Uh, it's something that you can maybe relate to in some way. And when I teach Bible classes, I usually find out people usually have very strong opinions about this book, good or bad, positive or negative. But I want to just have a step back in time a little bit, away from the idea of books and publishing and even what we know about religion, to just encounter this for what it was 3,000 years ago, which is exactly when it began. So to call it a book is extremely anachronistic. It was not anything near a book for the first 14, 1,600 years. That's a long, long history. So if anything today you walk out, you have this conception of a text that took very long time to develop. 
Now, whether that's something of faith for you, then that's for you to decide. But the Bible marks an epic shift in consciousness that is from an oral world to a textual world. And that shift also is reflected in religion, what become the major religions of the Western world. We talk about Judaism and Christianity and eventually Islam, that they inherit this idea of the text, sacred scripture. So how do you understand a text at the center of religion? And it wasn't always the case. So right in this time period, and the period I work on, is where we see that shift to become religions of the book. And what does that even mean? So um, to give you a little bit of uh, dead languages, <laughs> the Bible comes from the Greek, ta biblia, which is actually plural. It means books or scrolls. Um, it, it, right in the name is reflected that it was a collection of different texts. It wasn't this one object that we sort of think of in our minds. A, a good translation might even be not the Holy Bible, the Holy Library, um, and it kind of starts to shift the paradigm a little bit, that these were individual texts that were collected together. And then what I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second is about the collecting of all these texts. Who decided? Which texts? Why not these? Why those? And were some lost? But the main thing to remember is that this process took place over many, many years. Now, when we say Bible, just to back up a little bit, that does mean different things for different people. So for Jews and those who are familiar with Judaism, Bible is called Bible, Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh. You might have heard this term. And then in Christianity, we have Bible, which usually includes that Jewish Bible plus the New Testament. Now, we'll talk about this. Those books that are included in these collections are not all the same for everyone, but we'll leave that discussion for now. Um, just know that it was approximately 1,200 years for the Hebrew Bible to be put together, and then if we include the Christian New Testament, we're looking at a good 14 to 1,600 years. Okay, so just a thought before I jump in too far. I just want you to think right now, we talk about orality and textuality, the oral word and the written word. Think about what is the most powerful or authoritative today, in our world today. So think about it. What is more authoritative, oral, the spoken word, or the written word? And go ahead and turn to your neighbor and take a second and just discuss that. Okay, so how many, how many by raise of hand would say the spoken word is more powerful? Okay, what about the written word? Oh, okay. How about you have oversimplified a very complex thing? <laughs> Thank you. That's the right answer. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> right. So, I think we tend to think we um, rely upon the written word, right? We have legal codes. We have our example for today, the analogy of the Constitution, right? The written text is something that we sort of anchor to as Americans in many ways. Um, and so I want to talk about that as an analogy for a little bit. It certainly doesn't hold all the way through for the Bible, but it, it has some resonances with the, the history of the Bible. So when you think about the written word, most of us would say, we think that we're governed by this written word. But how do we take that word and apply it to us today? A few debates going on. Maybe a few, right? Civil rights, gay marriage, gun control, to name a few, right? What do we do with the text in sort of figuring that out? So does the text rule? Or do people rule? <laughs> spoken word, right? So, so today, again, I want you to keep in mind this idea that we think and we anchor to, to textual world, but almost always there is someone speaking, preaching, teaching, applying, or adjudicating about it, right? So this is the, tr this is the same case um, for the, the um, Constitution today. So let's go back then and think about the Bible. I'm going to give us a little bit more context. Some of you may know a lot. Some of you may know not as much. The Bible is written. It started out around, we want to say, 1,800 years before the Common Era, is when we talk about figures like Abraham, Sarah, um, the patriarchs and matriarchs of this 
Israelite religion. And just to give a little context is we're talking mostly about this area that is in the Middle East right now, which would be um, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and parts of Jordan, um, and Egypt as well. And the most important thing, if you I see some current students in the, in the, in the um, audience, I always hammer home that context is king or queen. Um, so when we think about the Bible and what was written, we always want to keep in, in uh, mind the context. So basically, we see a people group, the Israelites, or the early Hebrew speakers, living between two superpowers in the ancient world. So we have Babylon and we have Egypt. So basically, I'll sum up the history. They were battling it out, Egypt and Babylon. And where were they battling it out? Pretty much in the area we're talking about, right? So we think, oh, there's a lot of war in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff. This gives a little bit of context. Um, sort of pulled between the two superpowers. I use the example of the USSR and, and the US and the Cold War. And my students were like, what? The Russians are coming? What does that mean? But it's the same thing. We have two superpowers, and then we have these sort of intermediate states that get pulled. And that includes the Israelites and the early um, authors of the Bible. The most important thing to keep in mind when we read, especially the Hebrew Bible, that it was an oral, it, it, these were oral traditions. These were oral texts. And that's important to remember because sometimes we read them and we put them in other boxes. So now they are written, but they started out, a lot of these started out as oral traditions. Now, if you're living in a semi-nomadic society, which is what the early Israelites were for many, many centuries, you're gonna have different priorities um, and you're gonna have storytelling as a means of passing along truth and traditions and philosophy and theology. So I like to say story or history, it's more like story. Story is or was theology in that time. So we kind of like to think of stories as sort of the bedtime thing, but this really was the medium through which truth and ideas about God and the world and human relationships were, were taught through story. So that's just something to keep in mind as we move along. We have other indications in the Bible that orality was really, really important. Hear my child, your father's instruction. Do not reject your mother's teaching. There's a lot of emphasis on passing knowledge down mouth to mouth rather than um, through text. And a lot of memorization, which we don't do so much anymore. A couple other interesting items. If we think about Hebrew, the word in Hebrew for word, davar, is actually the same word for thing. So word and thing actually in itself are the same thing. There's this idea that words, the spoken words, are actually quite powerful. So that's um, something, and actually if you uh, see here, um, he, Aramaic, which is a language that is closely related to, to Hebrew, has that same uh, word root later on, and the word abracadabra actually comes from that same idea. It means as I abra, as I create, Dabra, I, I speak. So this idea of kadabra is that, you know, you have this power through your spoken word. Or sometimes it's called a speech act, right? You can actually create some reality through a spoken word. We have that today. Does anyone know of any examples? Do we create reality? The secret? Yeah, okay, the secret. That's one that's been really popular out there, right? You sort of speak into existence reality. What about I do? That creates a reality of marriage, right? So that's an example, um, and it was even more prevalent in that time. Okay, of course, just have to quote a little bit of the Bible. I, you know, can't get away from that. But the entire Hebrew Bible, the entire Bible begins with speaking things into existence, which is um, the Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, when the, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then God creates the first sort of thing. Now, keep in mind, creation in this context is not something out of nothing. It's order out of disorder, which is a very different concept that most people think is in the Bible. But then God says, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and what does God do? God names the light, speaks the light into existence in a way. 
Now, this idea of a word being powerful is also very prevalent in the New Testament and the Christian texts that come out of the Hebrew Bible. You may be familiar with this in John, one of the Gospels, where it talks about it's sort of a rewriting of this creation story. And it says in John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What happens in Christianity is this idea of word is so powerful that it becomes embodied in the person, in the, in the in div divinity of Jesus. So this is a reference to Jesus, but it's this idea that Jesus, or the divine God, is actually an active and powerful word. Um, so again, just to kind of highlight um, the, the, the impact of that. But what happens? What happens? Well, we see the invention of writing. And this happens, now I went to a Near Eastern Studies program for my beginning of my first sort of PhD program. And it's kind of funny because there was always like a Jerry Springer sort of debate who invented writing. So we'd have the Assyriologists and we'd have the Egyptologists fighting. It's about the same time. But we see technology, we see this invent invention of writing, and that sort of changes the world. And this is going to be a theme throughout the next few minutes where we talk about this technology, and then it leads to change, revolution even. So with the invention of writing, of course, we see civilization, we see that's why we have these two superpowers um, on either side of Israel. But not necessarily the greatest invention ever. If I were to say, what is the greatest invention of all time, what would that possibly be? Real, speech, fire, I would have gone with fire. <laughs> what? Well, I'm going to argue with all of you, so you can argue with me, that's fine. But the uh, most important invention of all time, I will argue, is the alphabet. <laughs> now, if you work in dead languages, you will realize how powerful that was. <laughs> so I will be the only one here who realizes that. So around this time, these Israelite Hebrew speakers actually invented the alphabet. Now, remember, the superpowers invented writing, but those writings were written with syllables. It was syllabic writing. So this is ancient Egyptian. If you study Akkadian, which is the cuneiform, every sign is a syllable, dab, mab, lab, mab, whatever. So when you learn Akkadian, you learn hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signs, I know. <laughs> so this radical concept is that one sound is one sign, right? One letter is one sound. How many, letter, how many signs do you have to learn? Well, for ancient Hebrew, proto-Hebrew speakers, it was 22, so that's a lot easier. So literacy and writing and the passing along of text, this is really the basis of that. Now, just a little cool gee whiz collection is that this was invented by Hebrew speakers, pre-Israelites, who were working in mines in ancient Egypt, and they saw Egyptian hieroglyphics all around them, and they didn't know how to read or write. But what they came up with was pictures, this is basically graffiti in the mines, we found, they came up with pictures of items, and they thought, oh, that picture will stand for the first letter of that name. So you can see here Alpu, which is the little crude drawing of an ox, and in Hebrew, or Proto-Hebrew, um, Alpu looked like that, I guess. <laughs> and then it became sort of schematized to mean A, or A, and then it kind of rotated, went through Phoenicians, Greeks, Rome, Latin, and then we inherited the A from this idea that the word, so now you'll never forget what ox is in Semitic languages, is alpu, right? So that's kind of a radical idea. It's more than a radical idea. And with that, it sort of ushered in the possibility of passing along traditions in a major way. Okay, so that's a little bit of this. So this technology, uh, it, it sets the stage for sharing some of these oral traditions and being read by more, more people. What we see is the oral word continues to dominate, but the written word starts to become present, especially for um, the early Israelites and the authors of the Bible. And that's something to um, remember, that that tension um, or that sort of distinction between the oral and written word never really goes away. So if you look at, I won't read all of this, but parts of the Bible, you can see this. There are a lot of repetitions in the Bible, those of you who've memorized all of the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> you'll probably be aware. If you memorize Leviticus, no. Um, if you've read, you'll see in the story of Exodus, 
Israelites come out of Egypt. There are all sorts of repetitions, um, things like that. And some people get kind of angst, angst filled about that. Like, what do we do with all that? Or sometimes it's called Mount Sinai, sometimes it's called Mount Horeb. What do we do with all that? A lot of that comes from these different traditions and sources. For example, in Exodus 15, we get some poetry that is um, here about Moses singing a song after they're uh, brought out of Egypt. And the other thing here is then it describes what happens. They come out of them. And then the prophetess, Miriam, she also sings a song. And she says, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. What are these? These are, these are the oral traditions. These are the songs that they eventually wrote down and put in. And the cool thing about these pieces that we kind of extract from the Bible were that a lot of women, that women had a more prominent voice. There were sort of non, sort of non, -mar so marginalized persons had a little bit of a stronger voice because they were able to participate in this oral culture much more readily than once they began writing down these traditions by a class of scribes. So we see Miriam, uh, Judges chapter 5 is one of these ancient poems or songs. It's um, Deborah sings this song. And then we have other ancient poems if you're interested, Deuteronomy 33, Psalm 68, um, Numbers 24. So we can see these things. It's really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go a little fast. I'm not, not trying to give you a whole history of the Bible, but I want to kind of contextualize it just a little bit. Um, we think we know a little bit about what's going on, but we really mostly just have the Bible. So again, do we read it as a historical document or not? That, I'm gonna kind of leave that for the question and answer period. But we do have indications of um, the Israelites going from a semi-nomadic society to kingship centralized in Jerusalem. And once that happens, things change in the religion. And the primary thing is having a capital having a palace, eventually having a temple, and this is what becomes Judaism. And then we also see that we have a centralization of religion. What happens with that kind of thing? Religion becomes public, it becomes centralized, it becomes part of a state, not state like we have today, but. Well, as I mentioned, some voices don't get heard as much, but text started getting written down. And this is where we start seeing the collection of texts. Because if you have a state, you want a constitution, right? You need texts. And that's exactly what was happening, much not unlike what we have, had happened in the United States. So here with King David and Solomon, a lot of these texts in the Hebrew Bible began being written, collected, and put together. Um, a big event in Jewish history, eventually they are sent into exile into Babylon. A lot of those texts they brought with them. And that's when, when the first real displacement from the land, when the early Jews were sent into exile, this is in 586 BCE, they began to, with fervor, write these texts down, right? Who am I? Who are we? We might be lost as a people. So after 586, we talk about the real collection of written texts, which makes sense when you have no temple, when you're no longer in the land, and that sort of thing. So again, I hope I'm just giving you a flavor for how diverse and how long it took for these texts to be collected. Now, one other interesting tidbit is that people today like to read the Bible as history. This kind of goes back to that, what does it mean to say it's true? A lot of people, when they say the Bible is true, they mean, or they, I think they think, they mean that it's historically accurate, or they want it to be historically accurate. Um, is, is that what the Bible was written to be? Now, I'm not going to tell you what to believe about it, but historically, the genre of historiography, the genre of history writing that we know, we just sort of inherit it, we don't even think about it, we inherited that from the Greeks. So Herodotus is a figure called the father of modern history, um, and Ingrid can probably clarify all my mistakes here. But this idea of writing, chronicling history in a way that you want to collect data, for data's sake, in a way. And of course, history is always filled with interpretive strategies, right? It's not just a, a neutral collection. But that whole genre of writing down history to collect information, numbers, battles, dates, that actually was in 400. And you can see most of these texts were written before that was really even a thing. 
So to read some of these texts as histories like we know, we just kind of write history in that same way, um, is putting a square peg in a round hole or a round peg in a square hole, I don't know. So that's just something to keep in mind. It wasn't intended to be history writing. It was intended to convey some truths. And like I said, most of those truths were conveyed through story. Um, so bringing us then to sort of the end of the Hebrew Bible and these stories that are being collected, I want to just highlight this really interesting text that describes this tension between writtenness and orality. And it's actually from um, Plato, but Plato's describing ancient Egypt and a story from ancient Egypt about the invention of letters. And um, we have this, the god who invents letters says, the invention of letters will make Egyptians wiser and will improve their memories. So this is the invention of writing. It is an elixir of memory and wisdom that I have discovered. Elixir of memory. But the chief god Amun replies, you who are the father of letters, but this invention will produce forgetfulness in their minds of those who learn it because they will not practice their memory. So there's this debate, letters are bad. You have invented an elixir not of memory, but of reminding. And you offer your students the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom, for they will read many things without instruction, but are, for the most part, ignorant and hard to get along with. <laughs> now, I was thinking about this, and I thought, if you inserted the internet <laughs> for letters, um, I think you who are the father of the internet um, we might think it's a similar shift in technology, right? You have invented an elixir not of memory, but of reminding, not of wisdom, but of information, right? What does it mean to have all this data, but not necessarily internalize it? Um, it it's something of reminding, not of memory. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thought that even way back when there's this debate about knowledge, about memory, about information that you internalize versus things that are put out externally. I think that debate is really going on now. If we think about our students writing papers and having a, you know, so much information, but not necessarily all the wiser for it. Now this debate goes on in Judaism. When we talk about Judaism after the Bible, Judaism as we know it today, we have texts known as the rabbinic texts, the Mishnah and the Talmud, and right in there are collections of oral traditions that were passed down. And right in there, they debate, we should never write these things down. And then, of course, in 200, they did. We're glad they did. So there's a debate going on in Judaism about that as well. And that debate about writtenness and orality continues into Christianity. We have texts in the New Testament, like Paul. Paul of Tarsus tells the Corinthians, you are a letter of Christ, you yourself, prepared by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but tablets of the living heart. And then another place he says, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So there's almost still the same sort of debate. Are the texts good, or do you really need to internalize something deeper? So going back to our analogy here with the Constitution, um, I wanted to say, what does it mean then to start to have an object? Like when writing is put down and the Bible itself becomes this, eventually, we start having something that we can point to, something that we can sort of anchor at. And this happens eventually with the Bible, and I think we have this analogy today. So what do we mean when we say things like, in our world, I believe in the Constitution, or constitutional rights, or Tea Party members, right? Elevating, venerating, in many ways maybe rightly so, supporting the Constitution. It becomes a thing, right? So what is that, what do you think that means? Do you think that it means the text itself, or do you think it means sort of the idea of a Constitution? Well, I'm going to say maybe there's a part of both, right? And I think that there's something that comes about in this analogy is once we sort of formalize the Constitution, we ratified these things, we put them as part of our national story, that they became powerful in and of themselves. And I think we could sort of invoke the Constitution even when we don't read it 
<laughs> constitutional rights. I don't really know what the Constitution says, right? This happens. Biblical, biblical view on this. I'm not really sure that I've read the Bible. Or I think I heard, I heard once that Jesus said, that, that's what I'm saying. I think that there's something that happens. So when writing takes over in the biblical world, that starts to happen. There starts to be a thing um, that can be sort of tapped into. Um, all right, let me just skip over. And that period um, when that happens just happens to be the period when the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. <laughs> you knew I had to work that in there somewhere. Um, so let me give you a little bit of what this tells us, because we're moving into a period that is slightly after the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible is finished, and right before the first Christian texts are written down. So of course these are the most exciting texts ever. Um, because they do actually give us a window into this otherwise dark age where we don't have texts that survive on perishable materials between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. We don't have anything. And this also overlaps with the life of Jesus, which is of, of interest to many, many people, right? And the early formulation of Judaism as we know it. So here's a window, and it tells us a lot about the Bible. So I'm going to skip all the really cool things about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I will tell you a few things about what they say about the Bible. So we see from the discovery, um, to go back here, this site called Qumran, which is near the Dead Sea in what is today Israel. At the time, it was under the British mandate when the discovery was made in 1947, and then it was under the control of Jordan, which actually plays into the political ramifications of the scrolls today. Um, I know because I've tried to organize an exhibit here in Denver, and there were some political ramifications. Who technically owns them and some people use Using them for political purposes on both sides. But needless to say, it was um, a discovery that was very important, and it was very important for the early state of Israel, because the early state of Israel came about, I mean, this not early state, the state today, nation state, anyone know? 1948, so this is right before the discovery, or right before the state came to be. Now, in these caves were found, some were in jars. We found these beautiful, beautiful texts. Again, these are up to 2,400 years old or more. And to have these things survive on perishable material is almost unheard of. The only reason this happened is that it was such a dry, hot area. We find in this um, collection of almost 900 scrolls. We have a, a library, a true library in that sense. We have one-fourth of those scrolls were copies of the Bible. Now, before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, does anyone know the earliest complete copy of the Bible? Now, we're talking Hebrew Bible because this is before the New Testament. Anyone want to guess? 900. 900. A little later for complete Yes, 1008 of our era. Yeah, so the Leningrad Codex, now uh, we have the Aleppo Codex, if you know that, but that's unfortunately missing a lot of pages, but our first complete copy of the Hebrew Bible was about 1,000. So when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had 1,000 years earlier, we have evidence of the scrolls. Now remember, these were copied and recopied. They were not just passed down by a printing press. So people ask those questions, were things changed in the Bible? Did things get dropped out? And the question was, well, we now have texts that are 1,000 years earlier. We can see and we can compare the manuscripts. So really fascinating for us scholars. Um, and also, some of you who know um, the, the uh, Catholic, Bible, Catholic Bibles and Eastern Orthodox Bibles have books that Protestants and Jews don't have called Apocrypha. So one question I often get is, oh, what did the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us about that? Um, just to know that they did include three of those Apocryphal books, um, if you're familiar with those. However, we're not always clear what they considered to be scripture and what they didn't. It doesn't really clear up a lot of debates that still go on. What else we found were sectarian texts. That means this group of Jews uh, wrote their own, including the community rule, which is their charter text. Um, they were waiting for the end of the world, so they had sort of a battle plan for that. They were very apocalyptic, looking for the end. And then we have the first biblical commentaries. So this, again, is a fascinating insight into the first commentaries on the Bible that exist. 
So what happens when the end of the Hebrew Bible comes about, the, 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 the texts become formalized, and they start to sort of figure out what books are scripture and which aren't. So let me just talk for a second about that. When you start to close your canon, we call, when you start to sort of not write new scripture, how do you get inspiration? How do you hear from God? If you're not writing new Isaiahs and new Jeremiahs, what do you do? Yeah, so you go back to what you have. So this is the moment when the Bible's formulating and the idea that, well, if the books, we can't just write new books forever, we'll go back to the old. And that's where, especially in Judaism, and then later in Christianity, of course, as well, there's this engagement with these texts that were written in the past. That's where inspiration was, was to lie. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, some, uh, half of the scrolls were already known texts, but most of them we only had in second or third translations. Um, and we have these two texts, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, which we think actually the members of the, the authors of the scrolls thought were scripture. We think that they thought that was part of their Bible. Um, and interestingly, if you know your New Testament in the Christian world, uh, the book of Enoch is cited in Jude. Some have argued that maybe the early, some early Christian communities thought it was scripture as well. So you can go read that. It'll be a fascinating um, read. Um, so here are some of the fragments. We also found out which books they liked the most in the Hebrew Bible, which was Psalms, Deuteronomy, and then the book of Isaiah. Now, if you think about Psalms, one example about that, if you know your Bible, these were a collection of poems, and we read them sometimes with devotion and with um, other poetry, but it was actually meant to be sung, sort of the hymnal of ancient Israelites. So it makes sense that they would have a lot of copies of that as they were performing these. And by the way, in antiquity, reading itself was always done out loud. So we sort of think of reading as kind of sit maybe with a text or a scripture, but they would always read out loud. So it was always kind of being performed in some fashion. Okay, now the question um, is, of course, we have this period right around the time of Jesus, right between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, and the question is, does it say anything condemning uh, or informative about Jesus? I get that all the time. So I'll just put it out there. We don't have Jesus listed by any name. And there, are, um, there is a teacher of righteousness that's described, and people have tried to make that Jesus um, or John the Baptist. But we love the authors of the scrolls because they use code names for everyone. And so we don't know. And of course, it would usually be that there would be, you know, sort of a hole in the text, right, in the really good spots. So... No, I'll just clarify, there's no description about Jesus, but that was part of the controversy for the first 60 years when the scrolls weren't fully accessible. But does that say anything condemning about the Bible? If we compare Isaiah from 1008 and we compare Isaiah from the first copy, 125 BCE, do we see a lot of difference? Now, it depends on the text you're looking at, but there's actually a lot of similarity. Very much so. If you think about the text, so for instance, if you're familiar with Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6 is the call of the prophet Isaiah. And there's this famous saying where it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Well, in the scrolls it says, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So a few things that are different. Spellings, uh, words that are missing, small uh, conjunctions, things like that. But overall, pretty amazingly consistent. Especially when you say you think about copying and recopying over hundreds and hundreds of years. If one scribe makes an error, that will kind of be recopied and recopied. So it's pretty miraculously uh, consistent. However, I have to show you um, one example. Excuse me, let me see. That was not. Um, one paragraph that was missing. Now, this is big stuff for us Bible scholars. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls did illuminate a few things in the Bible that had been lost. And this is the biggest example we have, which is a paragraph in 1 Samuel chapter 10, between chapter 10 and 11. And it's a story in, if you open your Bibles, a lot of Bibles still don't have this paragraph. It's about Samuel, the prophet, and Saul. And they go away, and they go to this place called Jabesh Gilead, and they're kind of hanging out there. And then in most Bibles today, it picks up and says, then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and he cut off all their, uh, their, thrust out all their right eyes. 
Now, for those of us, I'm sure there are dissertations that have been written on this. It seems a little like, well, what, what happened to Nahash? Like, why was he so angry? Well, some come to find out. This is a missing paragraph that happened um, somewhere in the, in the um, copying, and it happened to be preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we have this whole paragraph. Now, Nahash the king, and it kind of gives the background for the story, and then he said he would gouge out the eye of everyone who would not grant Israel a deliverer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then that sort of explains it. Now you're like, okay, the world is not going to stop turning because of this. But for us, it was really exciting. Um, and you can see that a scribe, so what happens is Nahash is the beginning of both these paragraphs. And what happens when you copy? You copy, you move down, and then you go back up to Nahash, but this scribe went up to the wrong Nahash, and so left out the intervening paragraph. So we know what's happening. We can figure it out. It wasn't intentional. It was probably just scribal error. Okay, so what do you do with that? I mean, do we know anything more? Can we see anything more? Well, that's our biggest example. So it is interesting that not more text is lost or changed over all these years. So we can say from the scrolls that they're witnesses to the text. This is the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. They're very similar. Um, however, there are different versions of books. So while the text itself can be quite similar, there are different versions of the book. Now, that is something where I want to emphasize again, we have an idea of Bible, and it's pretty concrete, and we are pretty fixed on the text being exactly right and every word being exactly interpreted correctly. But in that time, again, the message was more important than the fixity of the Bible or the texts. So while it's kind of coming to be, we still have... Differences. So for in that example, the book of Jeremiah, there are two versions. One was one-eighth shorter, and one was a little bit longer. The little bit longer one is the one we inherited, and by we, I say most of us who read Bibles today in English, they come from this one strain that comes through the Jewish rabbis, and they all are the longer version. But we know that they had the shorter version and the longer version right next to each other. It didn't bother them. They weren't so fixed on the text has to be, like that would cause a lot of confusion for people, I think, in many religious communities today. It didn't seem to cause them any problems because it was the message of Jeremiah rather than the actual technical words themselves and every single, um, every word that goes with it. Okay, so we have a couple, a couple main ideas, um, technology, is sort of the precursor to these changes. We have the spoken word, but we still have this tension between spoken and written. The Bible, according to the scrolls, at least the Hebrew Bible, was quite consistent, surprisingly consistent over the thousands of years that it was copied and recopied. Um, and then the last thing that we're going to talk about, which is, again, the question about books themselves, missing books or suppressed books. And so when we talk about that, we're going to talk about what we call canon, which is which books are okay, which make the cut for scripture and which don't. And the other thing that we find from uh, Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and also what I'll talk about in just a minute, is that the decision of what books were included and weren't was a very gradual one. So I'm sorry if you watched The Da Vinci Code. And Dan Brown told you that Constantine suppressed lost gospels and Jesus really had a wife. Not really that way. I wish, you know, it makes for better television, but not really reality. So what happened? So what happened was um, this idea of, of, of certain books being considered scripture um, and that happened in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament before the New Testament, because it was written before. But we have this idea um, that those books became just over time, people just accepted the authority of the books. The first five books were the most popular, the Law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They were set pretty early on. The prophets were set pretty early on. And then we have about the time of Jesus. And people always say, what Bible did Jesus read? Did he read the long version of Jeremiah or the short version of Jeremiah? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one he pulled off the shelf. But we do know that at the time of Jesus, there was still debate about some books of what would have been the, 
the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. And these were books that you might understand some of the debate, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Proverbs. These were the last ones. But again, they were very slowly being debated. And the rabbis, we have record of their debates later on, um, and they talked about this, Song of Song being erotic poetry. Early Christians, early Jews had a problem with, should that be in the Bible? And we have this debate going on um, with the rabbis, and then one rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, stands up and says, no, this is the Holy of Holies. This is the holiest book of all, the holiest book. So we see this debate going on. It's not a top-down kind of thing. One person say, nope, that book's going to be suppressed. Now, in Christianity, it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, okay. Okay. Um, the other thing that, as I mentioned, was happening, this is about the time of Jesus between um, the writing of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, was, as I mentioned, the closing of these canons, the books, we get biblical interpretation. So I only highlight this again because I think this process is still with us for many of us in Western um, society. This idea that once the texts become closed, no new scripture being written, then we start interpreting. Now what happens when we start interpreting these texts? We all get along? <laughs> No, we get denominations and denominations and denominations, right? Gay marriage. Should we have women as priests or rabbis? All these questions go back to the text. But if it's not explicit, then we, we interpret, right? So what comes with interpretation is we have division, we have disagreement, and we have identities that become attached to different interpretations. So you don't just write a new book, you go back to the books, but you read it differently. The meaning is, is housed somewhere else. So again, I highlight this, is this is the time when this happens. And at the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls and then later, that's when we see the flourishing um, of Jewish sects, different groups of Jews, and then eventually we have Christianity, which has its own story. Um, and one of those Jewish groups was the followers of Jesus, and they interpreted the text in a certain way, right? They were Jews, and they were practicing Jews for quite some time. Okay, so with that, we have um, the people of the book, this idea that what you believe can be found within the texts that are already written. Um, and that is going to lead uh, to... As I mentioned, there were different Jewish sects at the time, including Christianity, and then Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, various groups in Judaism. Now, what happens after, does anyone know your Jewish history? After the temple is destroyed, the Romans come in, pretty much wipe out the infrastructure of Jewish religion. Which one of these Jewish sects or which ones survived? The Pharisees, right? So they became the predecessors of what we know as rabbinic Judaism today. So we had all these different versions of Judaism, and one sort of won out. And then, of course, we have Christianity. Now, I really love the scrolls because they illuminate a different version of Judaism that actually sometimes makes people feel uncomfortable because it's sort of somewhere between Judaism and Christianity and some of its belief. But that's one thing that happened in that context of people beginning to interpret texts and, and such. So we have the Jerusalem temple being destroyed in 70. This is pretty radical. Judaism and Christianity, which was a Jewish sect at the time, was basically without a religious center. So after this moment, even more so, texts become central. This was already happening before, but now it's critical, right? So if you're not going to sacrifice animals, you're not going to have a priesthood who's functioning, offering incense, what do you do as a religion? How do you reinvent yourself? And Judaism reinvented itself in a way that text and the study of text became the activity of inspired activity of choice. And Christianity in many ways in inherited some of that as well. So beyond 70, we see sort of a new impulse for Judaism to kind of finalize what books were in the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish canon. And this happened again, not a top-down thing, but by the second century of the Common Era, those books had been fixed. The Bible, as Jews know it today, pretty much stayed the same. And there's no debate about which books are included and which aren't. Now, Christianity <laughs> is a little bit different. Um, 
I don't want to take too much time because I want lots of time for questions, but I'll just say that the, the flourishing of Christian churches in the first few centuries of Christian history actually led to a lot of different communities having different texts as part of their Bible. Now, the New Testament, when was it written? So Jesus is the first part of the first century. The New Testament is around 50 until maybe 100 or a little after, depending on your dating, right? So after the life of Jesus, but not necessarily too long after, the first letters of Paul are the first ones being written. Now, within Christianity, there was um, the writing, but there was also this impulse to proselytize. So I'm going to go back to technology again and talk about how the route Christianity took was different than Judaism, partly because of different technology or the use of different technology. So early Christian, now again, this was a Jewish sect, uh, they began to spread throughout the Mediterranean, and one of the things that was ad adopted whole scale was new radical technology, just like the iPhone, but not. <laughs> it's the codex. This was radical because we went from scrolls to now having leaves of paper that were bound. So this is what we think of as a book. That was not existent through all those centuries I was just talking about. They were scrolls. And then by the end of the first century, we have this invention. Now, it comes from the word for wood because it used to be wooden sheets that were bound together. And then eventually we have papyrus and other forms of sort of paper. But it worked really well and Christianity adopted it whole scale. Why? If you're going to preach and teach and proselytize and you're like, I've got the verse for you, it's not exactly user-friendly. Unless you're in a synagogue and you're working through the text in a liturgical fashion, it's great, right? And it still functions that way in synagogues today. But when you're sort of you know, debating and, and, and proselytizing and doing that, it just functioned really well. And that actually was the re one of the reasons that Christianity was able to spread um, its ideas so easily throughout the, the Mediterranean world. But this is an example where the medium again, was very important, and it actually set apart part of the reason that Christianity was able to identify as a distinct religion. I mean, it wasn't the reason, but it facilitated that. Okay, a couple more thoughts about the New Testament then, before we take some questions. Um, the New Testament was written, again, different letters, different genres, different hands, over a shorter period of time, maybe around 50 to 60 years span of the writing of all the texts in the New Testament. But after that, we actually have a plethora of copies or fragments of all of these texts, more so than we do of the Hebrew Bible, but it's also um, more recent as well. So it is the most uh, preserved collection of texts or sort of referred to or copies or attested to collection of texts in antiquity. Now, a lot of these are 100 years, 200 years, and then beyond be past the actual writing, but these are copies of copies of copies, but a lot of them actually are quite early. One example of the first complete actual New Testament in a bound form is Codex Sinaiticus. Anybody been to Egypt, Sinai Peninsula? Height, Mount Sinai, which isn't really Mount Sinai, I hate to tell you. <laughs> Jebel Musa, which I found out in the middle of the night when I got lost trying to hike to the top. Uh, it was a little bit confusing. There's really nothing out there. But there is a tradition but from the fourth century that this is where Mount Sinai was, and we have this monastery and this beautiful, beautiful book, one of the most important books in Christianity and, in some ways, Judaism, because it has the first complete copy of the New Testament. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And they had the first part, which was the Hebrew Bible, but it was translated into Greek. So that was not the first copy of the Hebrew Bible, but the Greek translation of that. Okay, so that's helpful for us to understand. By, by this um, fourth century, we have pretty much this order of books and which books are going to be in the Christian canon. Now, it doesn't end there, of course. So did Constantine keep Gospels of Jesus out of the New Testament? Are there lost Gospels? Well, as I mentioned, not really. Constantine was the first Roman, Empire, Roman emperor to adopt Christianity and changes it into the official 
religion of the Roman Empire. Now, this does come with radical administrative changes and some suppression of dissent among the various churches who up until that point did not have central leadership. So there was some sort of um, winnowing of these Christian churches and some Christian texts. But as I mentioned, most of these Christian communities had already sort of decided which texts were there, um, were, were useful. So Council of Nicaea mentioned in Dan Brown, this was when Constantine eradicated these lost gospels, didn't happen. It was there to sort of eliminate debate about the nature of Jesus, um, the dates for Easter and sort of things like that, but not really about setting the canon per se. We have other councils um, and other early Christian writers who talk about which books are included in the New Testament and not. Um, most of it was that the order was kind of fluid, and they had a few extra books that eventually didn't make it in. But most of it is set, and all Christians have the same collection of New Testament texts. Okay, so last but not least, I want to just go to the formulation, finally, of Bible's book. So after a thousand years of copying, it gets exhausting to copy the entire Bible. <laughs> and we have our first Gutenberg Bible, the first printing press with movable letters that we then now are printing Bibles. Now, how is this radical? It's such a radical change. Again, technology facilitates an oftentimes revolution, right? We've seen changes, social, religious changes because of technology. This definitely set the scene for that. So we have now this sort of copying that is not the same as a scribal hand, right? We don't get the errors that you would get from a scribe copying and copying. We also have a better accessibility to the text, right? So you're not, in the Middle Ages, usually hearing or seeing or seeing mystery plays or iconography. That's how you're familiar with the text, by and large. But now we start to have more accessibility of this. But more importantly for us is this idea of the text as a book, the Bible as an object, as an item, a book as we know it. Um, and I might point out, people tie then, quite soon thereafter, we see the Protestant Reformation and these calls and sort of this reaction against the Roman Catholic Church saying, no, you know, sola scriptura, like, let's go back to the text. So it does facilitate the Protestant Reformation as well. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up then, we're, we're kind of going to today, we're talking about the Bible as book. Um, it's an object that we oftentimes have an idea about, like I said, it's sort of an artifact in a way. But today, technology is also changing it, right? So we think about the online sort of versions and uploading and Bible zines, which are Bible, kind of Bible, with lots of like for teenagers or goth or whatever. Gospel. Um, yes, of course, the Schofield Study Bible is a good one. <laughs> um, so this is this idea that we have is that there is this thing called Bible, but a lot of people don't always necessarily know the the content. So this is where I'm going to kind of end today: is that we have the object or the medium of Bible, and a lot of people are familiar with it. Like they can kind of think Bible, but they don't necessarily know what's in it or take my classes and read it. <laughs> like that to happen. So I have just a quick little thing here and then. All right, so let's talk about what your favorite Bible verse is, okay? How about this? God helps those who help themselves. Do you like that one? Well, that's great, but there's just one problem. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> now, how about God works in mysterious ways? Let's see, what book, what chapter and verse is that in? Well, you're going to be looking forever because it's not in the Bible either. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Nope, sorry, that's not in there either. John Flake is a longtime religion writer. His article on CNN.com actually calls out expressions that sound biblical, but they're not. John, welcome. Thank you. All right, now here's one that stood out to me. Let me go ahead and get out my, uh, my notes here. Um, somebody actually thought this dog won't hunt was a Bible verse. I mean, that sounds like something out of Dukes of Hazard. Right, and this person was a, a student in a college religion class. So you would think they would know better. 
But that's how perver pervasive uh, biblical literacy is. Uh, oh. I think the Bible is kind of like the Constitution. We quote it, we revere it, but a lot of people don't actually read it. And, and, and also, too, you sort of add your little touches here and there, right? You right. kind of decide, hmm, this might sound a little better this way, and the next thing you know, it, it's become a verse to people. Right, right. <laughs> people kind of embellish things. It's like if I told you a story right now, and I went downstairs, five minutes later, the story has changed. And so people like to embellish, add little poetic touches, and that changes the scripture and the story. It's like the game of telephone. Remember, you'd whisper something, and by the time it got around the room, it was totally different from right. what you whispered? Right, right. I'm going to wait a long way back. You may not remember that no, game, John. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at some other examples, shall we? Okay, um, how about, uh, well, actually, let me ask you this first. How did, or, or how did these expressions actually become biblical to people? Is it just because they heard them from somebody and then kind of took it as the truth? Or how did it, what well, did you find? that's one way, just various ways. Uh, often uh, one way is that people would tell Bible stories through pictures. So, uh, for example, if you take the Garden of Eden, uh, there is no Satan in the Garden of Eden. If you read the book of Genesis, it does a serpent, but he's never identified as Satan. But if you're an artist, you want to draw a picture. It's so much better if you draw the Satan as a devilish tempter. So that's one way these stories became biblical. Okay. So that's a little flavor, right? What does biblical mean? What does constitutional mean? We can authorize things by saying that's biblical or that's constitutional, whatever. It's just that analogy. So, so just to kind of wrap up then, um, I hope that this exploration of the history of the text gives you a little bit more insight, but also this question that I constantly think about, about what does it mean or what do people mean when they say the Bible is true? And the danger that there is inherent to assuming that, because if you don't know the text, right, there's a danger of repeating things and them getting taken on. Something I like to say in my classes is that even if something isn't true, if it's repeated often enough, it's true in its consequences, right? And if it's not true, it can be true in its consequences. So in thinking about the Bible um, and thinking about what is in it and what is thought to be in it, um, hopefully you have a better perspective of the history of this long, long, long known text. Thank you so much for your time. I think we have time for some questions. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the great lecture. Um, are you uh, familiar with the works of John Marco Allegro? Yes, very familiar. Can I just ask you to comment Please. on so his Please. So he work? was a, one of the early team of Dead Sea Scrolls scholars. There was a very limited team, and he was on that, yeah. And what, what do you think about his conclusions that uh, Jesus, who wasn't referenced in the texts, mm -hmm. might actually be a uh, naturally occurring entheogen? Right. So I don't know how much you've read of John Mark Allegro. There's kind of this, this thing that happens with scroll scholars is some of them, by the end of their career, they start writing things that people con consider unorthodox. And John Mark Allegro wrote a book called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, where he argued that Christianity was a result of a hallucinogenic mushroom. Um, most sort of dismiss that. Um, he actually was a very fine scholar. I mean, I think this is what you're referring to. Is that right? Yes. You, reference to that. Most would say that that, you know, lacks a lot of background. He kind of went off and didn't cite a lot of sources. I don't know that there's any real textual evidence for that other than kind of what he started to just think. So I don't know that. I mean, I certainly don't think it's very historical. I think a lot of people dismiss it as well. Okay. Uh, one more thing, if I may. Uh, sure. Well, there are two audiences, the... Uh, meant in the sacred text, the, the, pro, the profane and the sacred. Mm -hmm. So the allegory could either be interpreted um, literally or the allegorical interpretation could be more spiritual in that um, entheogen-induced state. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's definitely different layers that the text was indicating. It's possible. It definitely is possible. The problem is we lack the historical 
so, you know, the, 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 the texts that support it. But I, I agree, there's definitely different layers that you can be reading these texts. So yeah, thank, thank you for thank your you. question. Yes. Hi, wonderful lecture. Thank you. One thing I'd like you to comment on is the fact that uh, Israel wasn't necessarily a country. It was the Northern Kingdom and the mm -hmm. Southern Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the, there were writers of the North, in mm -hmm. the Northern Kingdom, writers in the Southern Kingdom, Yahweh versus Elwa, uh, Elohim. Mm -hmm. And so they had, somebody had to put those two together, mm -hmm. especially for the first five books of the Bible. Great. Could you comment on the, how the integration of that, I mean, they had their own perspective in the north, yeah. they had their own perspective in the south, mm -hmm. and they had to integrate it. And you will find two stories, two mm -hmm. of the same stories a lot of times. Yeah. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, so he's referring to, you know, all the things I skipped over and the elaborate history of the Hebrew Bible, one of which is the first five books are thought to have had four major sources. Um, and two of those sources are loosely identified with coming from the northern kingdom or collection of, of tribes and then um, one from the south. And what happens is the northern tribes in history get attacked and carried away by the Assyrians in 722 BCE. So those lost 10 tribes, sometimes you'll see this on the news, or these lost 10 tribes were the 10 tribes in the north that got taken. And then the southern main tribe was Judah. We have a little bit of Simeon and a few Levites. And Judah persisted longer from 722 to 586. When I talked about that exile, that exile into Babylon was really just the southern kingdom. So they lasted longer, and they had Jerusalem as their capital. So most of the history we inherited in the Bible was written from the southern perspective. But like you mentioned very astutely, we have traces of the north. One of the reasons we have a different dialect of Hebrew, they called God Yao, Y-A-W was the dialect, and then there was a slightly different name for God in the south. And so we see personal names and certain traces that come into the text from the north with that dialect, but most of what we have is from the south, yeah. May I, if there are not many other people, um, Hebrew did not have vowels. Right. And so we had to insert, we have inserted vowels. Yes. And so it could, they could have various meanings. Could yes. Could you talk about that, please? So to make things even more exciting, Hebrew was not written down. Now, it had vowels. It wasn't written with vowels. Now, whoever thought, let's write the language down, but let's just forget those little pesky vowels. I'm not sure what the reasoning was, but you're right. So the early first number of centuries, so the earliest texts from King David that were written down all the way until even the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, those were not primarily, well, really primarily not written with any vowels, so over a thousand years. So for them, they would see the word and they would know the vowels. For us reading it, we'll see, you know, C-T, right? And it could be cat, cut, cute, you know, for us, this is an English example, obviously. Um, and so, I, are you asking kind of why they did that? No, I'm, or, wondering, I'm wondering about the misinterpretations oh, that could occur absolutely. because of that. Absolutely, so example is the name of God, right? Now, there weren't any vowels written for a very long time, but even when vowels started to be added to the text, they didn't add the vowels for the name of God, just to use that example, yep. right? Because they didn't want people to accidentally pronounce it. So that was an important thing theologically. But other than that, it was more that when the text became fixed, they wanted to eliminate some of these confusions. So by the seventh century of the Common Era, we have this group of rabbis that called the Masoretes that say, yeah, we ought to add the vowels, and they do, but it isn't until the seventh century of our Common Era. So yes, you're alluding to, there can be a lot of words that we're still not quite sure about. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for coming to speak. Uh, sure. uh, I like how the beginning of your presentation showed the um, Ark of the Covenant, if mm -hmm. I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so I come from an Orthodox Ethiopian family. Okay, um, wonderful. So our tradition is, is partially based on the notion that the Ark of Covenant is, um, is located in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the north. Have you been to the building? I, I have been. To, okay. I was nice. able to, to walk nice. in, obviously. Nice. Um, I've, never, I've never been to the building. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's nice. Um, <laughs> I think you should tell Vendel Jones that it's her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if you know, if you know the, the story, but uh, so no, basically no one is allowed 
in, but the monk who's uh, blind, so he can't even see the, the ark. Um, so, so no one physically ever seen the, the Ark of the Covenant. So I was wondering if, you know, you being an expert on Judaism, what, how does the, the, the Jewish tradition mm -hmm. feel about that? So mm -hmm. do they agree on our Orthodox tradition or is it, mm -hmm. or, so basically, are we right or are we wrong? Like basically, that's my question. Like, well, so I would like access <laughs> to this building in Ethiopia that has, the, I suppose it's said to have, our, generally speaking, Judaism has not accepted that tradition. Okay. That's Partly because we sort of have a blank period when the Babylonians come and they take the Jews into exile and the temple is destroyed the first time. That's when all textual sources go silent on what happened to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. So that's 586 BCE. So it's not that it's not possible, but we have no train of command, no train of evidence that sort of leads us to that. So generally, it's accepted within most Jewish and Christian circles that we just don't, we know. don't know where it or is. the Babylonians melted it down and you know whatever. Okay. But you know it's certainly a very alive and well tradition in Ethiopia. So I'm just waiting yeah. someday for that. So that open. that's I don't know if you know, but it's 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 because of uh, King Solomon and the the relationship he had with oh, the right. Queen of Sheba. So Sheba. we say that she took the Ark of Covenant. Cause they 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 had a child named Menelik who uh, started the Ethiopian. Uh, tradition mm -hmm. uh, there and we we believe that they brought the Ark of Covenant with them and then it was hidden in Ethiopia for a while um, and actually every Orthodox Church in Ethiopia has a replica of the Ark because mm -hmm. it wasn't supposed to be revealed we they people weren't supposed to know where it was so mm -hmm. we had replica every church has a replica right. of it so I'm thinking field trip yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, yeah, thank for you. sharing. Hi, thank you again. Thank you. This lecture was amazing. Um, I have a couple questions for you. I, it's been a long time since I've read Misquoting Jesus by Bart Ehrman, but I seem to remember him talking more about things that were left out of the New Testament based on mm -hmm. some of the earlier texts. And um, I was wondering what you thought overall about Bart Ehrman's work and his conclusions. That's question number one. Question number two mm -hmm. is, I'm wondering what, why you think that it was so important for people back then and even today to have, to continue the, you know, to have the religious text and to, to keep it. Why is it so important to have mm -hmm. a Bible or, mm -hmm. you know, text of any sort? So. Mm -hmm. Good, good questions. Yeah, so Bart Ehrman generally is thought of kind of quite a, a minimalist in some ways in, in, in terms of what he, what he thinks about, about these things. I mean, I don't agree with a lot of what he says, although I think he's a fine scholar, and I think he sort of errs on the side of really the data that we've got versus tradition and some things in Christianity. So um, I, I wouldn't dis disown his work at all. Um, I don't think he always jives with traditional Christian kind of ideas and traditions. But um, the, the question about things getting left out, I mean, it's interesting if you go to this early Christian father, church father in 300, Eusebius, who talks about different texts in Christianity and why this text versus that. And he goes through and he has three criteria. Is it true? Is it re represent the ideology of Jesus correctly? And do all Christian bishops agree? And he goes through this really stringent criteria. And so because of that, he comes up with a list that's quite short. And I think that that's where um, there was some vetting of these early texts. And it's not just that they wanted something to rally around for their identity, but I think also to preserve the belief system. So I think that's kind of why in Christianity there was a, quite a narrowing down of those texts, to preserve those ideas and beliefs about Jesus because it was central to their religion. Thank you. Thank you. She's a good writer. <laughs> Karen Armstrong, she's very good. Do we have time for one more? Oh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, just briefly that uh, there was a period of time where the scrolls weren't as widely available. Yes. Can you comment on why that was? Was it the same political uh, complications that you ran into? Or yes, what? very much so. Um, I'll try to summarize it very briefly. The scrolls were discovered in 48, uh, 47. In 1948, the state of Israel was created immediately. There was war between the Arab states and, and the new state of Israel. So what happened was um, already we kind of had some conflict there, and then when we have the 
part of where the scrolls were found were then under control of Jordan from 1948 until 1967. And so those fragments were purchased by Jordan. They were under the control of the Jordanian Antiquities Authority. And Jordan, having not great relationships with, at the time with Israel and Jewish scholars, did not allow any Jewish scholars and created a team of seven international scholars to work on these new fragments. And it was a very one-sided group of people. And most of them, well, they were all men, and most of them were Catholic priests or monks. So it immediately created controversy over this next 50 years where not everyone had access to these fragments. They were slowly translating them, and scholars are a little, you know, a little slow in their publications, and they're also a little bit of ego working sometimes. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but um, they didn't want to farm them out. So for 50, almost 60 years, those fragments remained in the hands of those seven scholars, and very little was accessible to the public. So a lot of this conspiracy theories and things came about at that time. Um, and then in 1967, we have some changes, but mostly it wasn't until 1991 that that team of scholars was opened up and scholars around the world had access. So that's a long time. Um, and that's kind of what I'm referring to now is that there have been within the Israel-Palestinian kind of conflict, the scrolls have been used on both sides, pro and, and con. So that's part of why I was planning this exhibit and then there were some demonstrations and that kind of got shut down. Yeah, thanks. One more question? Okay. Hi, thanks. I just wondered what you could tell us. What do we actually know about the writers of the New Testament mm. books? Right. <laughs> if anything. Right, exactly. So the interesting phenomenon, I'll just say I love reading the New Testament, even though that's not my absolute especially, is that we do have some writers identified, whereas in the Hebrew Bible, we don't have this idea of authorship. So we know we have the book of Isaiah, but it doesn't say I, Isaiah sat down and penned from beginning to end. But in the New Testament, we do have references to names. So we do have some, uh, some references to who wrote these scrolls or texts, books, whatever we want to call them at this point. So Paul, the letters of Paul, for instance, I mean, we have the introduction and we have the conclusion. Now, not all of those letters are clearly Paul. Some think, oh, this sounds like Paul. So there's still debate about who wrote all of them. Some of them are a little bit more firm. So we know a little bit about most of what we know is what we have in the text themselves because we don't get these secondary writings, we don't have a lot of them until after these people, the 12 apostles, Jesus, Paul, these people have passed away. So we don't know a lot more than what's in the text themselves until we get a couple centuries. So is that, does that kind of answer your question a little bit? We know more than we know about the Hebrew Bible, but I don't want to overstate it because we, we really don't know anything. <laughs> At the end of the day, we'll end on that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>